Let's open our Bibles this morning to John chapter number 1. John chapter number 1. Now, we're going through this series that we've entitled 3G. And remember, it has nothing to do with, with phones. Nothing to do with cell signal and all those sorts of things. We're talking about the gather, grow, go. We want to encourage every single person to take their next step in their walk with God. So every G reminds us of a step that we need to take and information that is important for us to know. So we're in the very first G, and we're talking about gathering. So that's the very outside that you could possibly get. The very most basic thing that you can do is just kind of show up. And that's exactly what you've done today is you've shown up and we're gathering together as a group of believers. And when you come to church for the first time or you go to somebody's house for the first time or whatever it is, anything that you do for the first time, there's an introduction that takes place. So if I come to your house for the very first time, I don't really know you, I'll introduce myself, you introduce yourself, and then maybe you introduce your family members. And so we've been kind of introduced to a couple of things so far. We were introduced to God, and we saw that he's the creator of the world, and he is one, and yet three people. And I don't know about you, but it's hard for me to wrap my mind around that. And we gave an illustration of a cube in different dimensions to help us to understand uh, a little bit more about the complexity of God and why it is that it's so hard for us to wrap our mind around him. But we focused in talking about God, uh, looking at that first person of the Godhead, God the Father. And what an amazing God that he is. And we were reminded that he created everything, and so he has the right to make the rules. He has the right to tell us what to do and what not to do. And then we were introduced to a thing called sin. Now, if you're not familiar with the word sin, simply me, sin simply means breaking God's rules. So in other words, if God says, hey, I want you to do this, and you don't do it, that's sin. Or if God says, hey, I do not want you to do this, but you do it, that is sin. So breaking God's rules is sin. And he's dictated that for us. And a couple of weeks ago, in our last lesson, we, we talked about the fact that we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that because we've all done wrong and we've all broken God's rules, we deserve a punishment. So we have rules in our home. All right, boys and girls, how many of you have rules in your home? There's certain things you're supposed to do, certain things you're not supposed to do. Some of you are shaking your head like, no, I don't. I, dude, I know your dad. I know you have rules in your house. Okay, so we, we all have rules in our house. Now, if you break the rules, there's different punishments for that. I thought about going around the room to each kid and asking them different punishments for different things, but... We won't get that on camera, okay? So we'll spare our parents from some of those things. But because my wife and I made the rules in our home, we dictate what the punishment is for breaking those rules. Well, it's the same for God. God dictated the rules, and so he's the one who dictates what the punishment is. And he says, because we've sinned, we deserve eternal death. A spiritual death, eternity in the lake of fire. That's what we all deserve because of our sin. Now, that's what we've looked at so far. Now we're going to be moving forward. So I want to ask a question as we get started here. Um, how many of you have ever needed help in your life ever? You say, I've needed help before. All right, so every hand should be up. We've all needed help at different points. You can put your hands down. Somebody share with us what's one thing you need you have needed help with in your life. Grayson, what have you needed help with? Cleaning up. All right, so help getting help cleaning up, okay? Somebody else, what have you needed help with? Cameron. Homework. homework, right? There's been times in my life where I needed help with homework. Somebody else, what have you needed help with? Yes. Right, help not to be scared. Help to pray to God to keep you safe. Fantastic, Kate. All right, anybody else? What do you need help with? Yes, help moving. So we all need help. Yes, ma'am. 
Help in the grieving process when she lost her husband. Yes. So we've all had different things that we've needed help with. I have needed help with a lot of things in my life. So growing up, I never learned anything about cars. Never learned anything about taking care of them. I can change a tire. I can change my oil. I can do very basic things. But if something's really wrong with my car, I don't have a clue. Like, I'm one of those guys, when the, the car stops, I'll open a hood, I'll look at it, and I can't really do anything. That's it. <laughs> That's the extent of what I can do in getting my car operational again. So I need help with fixing my car. So I'm not super handy in home repair. My wife and I, we live in a house that is over 100 years old, so in that old of a house, there's always something wrong. Always something that needs fixing. So I don't know a whole lot about home repair. So if something breaks, then I need somebody who can come and help me fix those things. And so I'm thankful for the people that God has had in my life that have helped me because every stage of my life, I've needed help. And you have too. Now, thinking about the people that help us. Who is the person in your life that you would say, they have been the most helpful to me? I'm going to give you an opportunity to give a word of praise and thanks for somebody who's been helpful to you. Yes, Debbie. Husband has been helpful to her. and It's been great to see is the different health problems that Debbie's gone through and have her husband right there by her side being helpful to her. Because in some homes, when things happen like what's happened to Miss Debbie, the husband leaves or the wife leaves. They can't deal with the, the illness and the difficulty and all those things. So what a blessing that that is. Yes, Violet. Family's been the most helpful to her. All right, Cameron. Teachers and your mom have been the most helpful. Grayson. Your Mimi's been the most helpful. Allie. Your parents. Good. Ran. All right, Marlon, good. Yes, Patty. Sarah and my mother. All right, good. Yes, Kate. Um, my mom and dad and my and my friends. All right, so lots of help. Alan. All right, thank you. Yes, Jim. My son, Tim. Son, Tim. He's very handy, very helpful. So we all have different people that we would evaluate and say, you know what? This person has been the most helpful person in my life. And I would say for me, that is definitely my wife. My wife helps me with pretty much everything in my life. I would have a hard time getting, even getting ready in the morning without the help of my wife. Do you know where my shoes are? Do you know where this is? Do you know where that is? And uh, she was Google long before Google for me. So I'm thankful for somebody in my life who is so helpful to me and the things uh, that I need. You know, help is required when we can't do something ourselves. Uh, we learned in our last lesson about breaking God's rules, and we learned that because of that, and we've broken God's rules, we deserve eternity in the lake of fire. And the Bible tells us there's nothing that we can do about that. There's nothing that you can do to change the situation that you're in spiritually, nothing that I can do. I can never be good enough to say, you know what, I don't deserve eternity in the lake of fire anymore. Why? Because I've sinned, I've earned the punishment, I can't undo the sin. The sin has to be paid for. And the Bible says we can't do anything about that. I can't be good enough and you can't be good enough to change that. So each and every one of us need help spiritually. We can't do it on our own. And this is where Jesus comes in. So we've been introduced to God the Father. Now we're going to take a look at God the Son. We refer to him most commonly as Jesus. And here in John chapter number 1, let's look at number, verse number 14 together. Uh, John writes, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So as we meet in G and introduce to Jesus, one of the things that we first understand is that Jesus was fully a man. 
It says in verse number 14 that the word that is a name for the Lord Jesus Christ became flesh. So he took on human flesh for each and every one of us. And it was important for Jesus to be a man because it was man that had sinned. And so it was a man that needed to take the punishment for that sin. So Jesus was fully and 100% man just as you and I are 100% human. He was human. And he has that same aspect of humanity that all of us have. Now, he wasn't just a man. The Bible tells us that, yes, he was fully human, but at the same time, he also was fully God. So look back just a couple of verses at the beginning of chapter uh, number 1 of John. It says in verse 1, In the beginning was the Word. Remember, that's a name for the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Word was with God. And the word, notice this, what's, what's the next word? The word was. was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And then verse 3 says, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So it tells us not only was he human, but he was fully God at the same time. So there's never a time where he was not God. When he took on human flesh... He did not give up deity. He was fully God to the point the verse tells us he was God. He was in the beginning with God. And not only that, there's nothing made that was made that Jesus didn't make. And you remember going all the way back to Genesis 1.1 and we looked at it a few weeks ago in our, one of our first lessons. God, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And over and over again, this past month, I've been studying the book of John just in my own personal devotions. And over and over again, Jesus claimed to be God. Why? Because he was God. And it's important that Jesus was man because a man had to pay the price for man's sin. But it was also important that Jesus was God because a man could not pay for the sins of all mankind. If Jesus came and was just a man and managed somehow to live a perfect and a sinless life, then he could pay the price for one individual. He could swap out his perfection for one individual who sinned. Can you imagine having to make that choice? I can save one person in all of humanity. That's all he could do if he was just a man. See, it's important that he was God because only God could pay the price for all of mankind's sin. And so both aspects are so important. Now, let's turn to Matthew chapter number 1. Because he was man, he was God. But let's, let's take a look and see how God took on human flesh. In Matthew chapter number 1. Now, I, don't, I, I know you, many of you don't want to think about Christmas yet. We want to think about the snow and all that. I'm thanking God I don't live in Montana right now because they're getting hammered in some places with like feet of snow. But let's go back and look at this story that we kind of look at and celebrate around Christmas time. Matthew 1, look at verse number 18. It says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. So before they came together as a husband and wife physically, she was found with child here, it tells us, by the Holy Ghost. Verse 19, then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. And so he, he, it tells us here 
that Mary did not know a man. She was a virgin. The child given to her was of the Holy Ghost. So, in other words, she had a human mother, did not have a human father. Okay? If Jesus had a human father and a human mother, he would not be God. So, this is how he can be fully man and yet fully God at the same time. Don't ever let somebody tell you the virgin birth is not an important doctrine. The forgiveness of our sins depends upon Jesus being born of a virgin so that he can be fully man and fully God at the same time. And so here Jesus takes on human flesh. Luke chapter 2 and verse number 18 dictates to us that he grew uh, physically, intellectually, spiritually, and he lived a perfect and a sinless life which is required if he was going to pay the price for our sins. If Jesus sinned, he would have had to pay the price for his own sins and therefore could not pay the price for our sins. So he lived a perfect and a sinless life, and yet he paid the price for our sins. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. If you don't have your Bible, it'll be up on the screen for you so you can read it and see it with your own eyes. So I want you to, I want you to notice this. Look what the Bible says about Jesus. It says in verse 21, For he, God, hath made him Jesus to be sin for us. Now notice the next four words. Who knew no sin. Okay, Jesus never sinned, not one time. He didn't know sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. So, Jesus was sinless, and yet our sin was placed upon Jesus, and He was punished for us, so that we might have His righteousness. And we'll get more into that in our next lesson together. Look uh, just a couple of chapters back in 1 Corinthians 15. So you're in 2 Corinthians 5. Go back to 1 Corinthians 15. Now, in, in verse 21 of 2 Corinthians 5, we kind of looked at a, a little bit of what Jesus did for us. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4, we see Jesus' completed work summed up for us. It's what we commonly call the gospel. Whenever you hear the word gospel, this is what you need to think of. Gospel is not the whole Bible. It's speaking specifically about certain things that Jesus did. Look at verse number 3 and 4. Let's, uh, let's read these verses out loud together in unison, okay? 1 Corinthians 15, verse number 3 says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So, it tells us the gospel is this. That first of all, Christ died for our sins. See, He paid the price for your sins. He paid the price for my sins. It tells us that He was, second of all, He was buried. My sins were buried with Him. My old man was buried with Him. So was yours, if you know Jesus Christ is your Savior. Then it says it doesn't end there. And we shouldn't end the gospel story there. It tells us that he didn't stay dead. He rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So when you hear somebody say the word gospel, you should think of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. His death and burial take the punishment for our sin and bury it away from us. His resurrection makes it possible that you and I might have everlasting life instead of eternal death. So that's who Jesus is. That's what he's done for us. I want to encourage you if you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ to trust in him for salvation. And we're going to spend our entire next uh, Sunday morning together talking about the wonderful gift of salvation that's been made possible through the Lord Jesus Christ.